Hello everyone, welcome to Game Junk Prototype episode 54, recording on Friday, March 26th. My name is Frank. My name is Sean. And my name is Andrew. And for the first time in Game Junk Prototype history, we have a guest today. Uh, Graham Smith from Drinkbox Studios, who just unveiled, unveiled his new game today. <laughs> uh, Nobody Saves the World. Hello, Graham. Thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. It's been a while. Big day for you. How are you feeling? Feeling pretty exhausted. But yeah? <laughs> it was a very exciting day, that's for sure. Yeah. It's funny because I was thinking like, hey, we're getting them early before like all the press ramps up, but you've already done all the press. <laughs> like I didn't yeah. realize that's how it works. <laughs> yeah, for the last month, we've been doing like a virtual press tour, trying to meet with all the, the big sites and let them play the game a little bit because we wanted to try and get as big of a announcement splash as we could. So yeah, so it's been an exciting day watching that stuff coming out today. So we're getting Graham at his worst when he's most tired. <laughs> Graham doesn't have a worst. He's the best. <laughs> And uh, so we're going to talk about that game. We'll briefly, I guess, say that it was part of an ID at Xbox showcase that took place today that was quite lengthy, uh, three hours and 21 minutes, if I recall correctly. And I, I watched most of it. I had some at 1.5 speed. I skipped here and there just because it was really long and I had to watch it before today. And I didn't start until two or three o'clock or something like that. So... Uh, <laughs> Anyway, a lot of games were shown. We'll talk about some of that after the fact, but let's talk about Graham's game first. Uh, so, Graham, do you want to tell us about your game? Give us, like, not necessarily a pitch, but what the game's about? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'll try and keep it concise, but it's... it's it doesn't uh... have to be an elevator <laughs> pitch. It's whatever, however you want to explain your game, there's no rules. Yeah, the problem with our game is it takes a lot of words to explain because it's pretty complicated, but, and there's not really anything out there that's quite like it, but um, you can imagine it's kind of like, it's a t it's a action RPG, uh, kind of uh, uh, with a, kind of in the vein of old school Zelda. So it's like a top down 2D style with a big overworld that you're exploring throughout the course of the game. Um, but in our game world, we have uh, dungeons everywhere. There's like 25 different dungeons that you'll find as you're going through there, in addition to like towns and NPCs and everything. Uh, but the main gameplay loop as you're going through is you're, you're slowly uh, unlocking new forms or classes, um, uh, uh, which are pretty not, there, there's some standard ones like, you know, guard and ranger, but there's some really non-standard ones too, like egg and mermaid and horse and uh, zombie. And uh, so we've, right now we've got about 20 classes in the game. Um, and uh, so the way that the main gameplay loop is working is like at the very beginning of the game, you, you uh, unlock the ability to become a rat. And when you're playing as the rat, you can see that the rat has these quests that it has to do. And the first, the initial quests are like kind of like training you how to play as the rat and the, the moves of the rat. And as you finish these quests uh, and redeem them, your rat ranks up. And when your rat ranks up, it gets new abilities. Uh, but also sometimes when you rank up, you unlock a new form with its own abilities. So at the start of the game, you, you see this tree of forms that you don't have access to. They're kind of like all grayed out. But as you're like working, as you're playing the game and doing quests, you're starting to unlock more parts of the tree. And every time you unlock a new form, it's kind of like a completely different gameplay experience because they all control completely differently. They have different strengths and weaknesses. Um, and, uh, and, you know, some forms are better at some things than others. So in some of the dungeons that you go to, uh, before you enter, you can see like what kind of, um, what kind of enemies are going to be inside of there. And, you know, and you start to learn like certain moves work against certain types of enemies. Um, and, uh, later in the game, you actually gain the ability to like cross pollinize your moves between like, you can make custom builds on your, on your classes. So like, uh, on your rat, you can put some extra moves that you found on the zombie. And. Uh, so you're always looking for like these synergies or complementary things that you can put together on builds so that you can take on the harder dungeons in the later half of the game. So that's kind of like in a nutshell what the, what the game's about. Cool. So I am a terrible host, as we know, but I, <laughs> I failed to say that uh, Graham is the co-founder and producer at Drinkbox Games, which he's been on before and we've talked about his games. They've made Guacamelee, Guacamelee 2, uh, Severed, Mutant Blobs Attack. Am I forgetting the name of the first Mutant Blobs? Is it the same or is About it... a Blob, yeah. About a Blob, yeah, sorry. Which uh, is only so... available on PS3, which may not be very soon. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, uh, a, a lot of great games they've made, games that I love in particular, I think. Also, hey, also double down on your bad hosting. You also forgot to say the name of Graham's new game that he was just talking about that we didn't say. I thought I did. Nobody Saves the World. 
I didn't yeah, say he it. said it. He said it. Don't worry. <laughs> oh well, now we're saying it again. Good. I'm not paying it. <laughs> keep the, keep that name coming. We'll, keep saying we'll it a few more times. <laughs> there we go. So yes, nobody saves the world, which I think looks very interesting. I I'm a huge fan of their games. Guac is the best Metroid-like series on the planet for my money. Um, but I, I have a few questions. So number one. The changing forms to me seems inspired by turning into a chicken in guac, like taking that idea and expanding it out. Am I, am I in the ballpark here? Is that part of the inspiration or did it come from somewhere else? It, it came from somewhere else, but I can totally see how you would think that uh, yeah. because you know, you were a chicken in that game. Now you're a rat in this game. I can, yeah, totally makes sense. Um, but no, it was like the unique gameplay ideas. Right. And I, I'm like, that seems like, Oh, if we could do that as many times as we want, people seem to love that. How could we make a game out of that? Yeah. And I think you're right that like the appeal of being a chicken is similar to the appeal of being like some of the weird forms in our, in our new game for sure. Um, but the, the, the guy who pitched, uh, pitched this game initially, uh, he was one of the, he's one of the other founders of Drinkbox, Chris Harvey. Uh, he was taking, um, uh, inspiration from Final Fantasy Tactics games. Like they have these job systems in there, uh, which I've never played those games. So I, I really don't know how they work, but, um, the way he describes it is like, just like as you're playing kind of like in Skyrim, if you're doing like certain tasks, you'll be ranking up certain job characteristics yeah. and, um, and, uh, so, so that was kind of like the seed of the idea that we started this project with, um, like take that and then make like a, a, a like a dungeon crawler with a large overworld. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. So I wanted to ask about, like, we were kind of just talking before the show about this, but you know, there's a lot of roguelike and roguelite games out there. That's kind of like the thing right now, especially for indie games. But, and you guys have the procedurally generated dungeons, but you're not really a roguelite or roguelike. Any yeah. particular reason you decided not to go fully in that direction? Uh, I guess the game never was going to be like that. I mean, even the random uh, generation of the dungeons was something that wasn't in like the very original plan. Like initially we were thinking we we're gonna handcraft these dungeons. <clears throat> And for maybe for like the first third of the project, that was still kind of the plan. Um, but w like the reason that we ended up uh, going with the procedural generation is because we wanted to have a lot of dungeons and we figured that it was going to be easier. And also when you die in a dungeon, we didn't want to have to replay the same content and we weren't sure how the checkpointing was going to work. So uh, for those reasons, we kind of thought like, okay, procedural generation is the way to go. So we just made like a, like a, a good set of rules where you can generate like lots of different feeling dungeons. Uh, with with the the tools that uh, or the rule set that uh, that we that we designed. Yeah, you talked about that rule set on the stream as well, and then my mind started <laughs> kind of yeah. going as to what that could be. I'm assuming there's because each well, you highlighted the idea that there's concepts behind each dungeon, which sound really fun and funny and interesting. So I'm sure there's like key rooms, highlight rooms that you know are very specific to each dungeon, and then more generic connector pieces that fit in any dungeon, but change the tile sets and stuff like that. And I Got was, was yeah. kind of getting some ideas as to how that might work. And it sounds intriguing. I think a lot of these roguelike, roguelite procedural games are, you know, integrating story and making it more interesting in terms of replayability, not just being procedural. So <clears throat> I think the hybrid of action RPG and procedural dungeons I think I, I think there's a game that's done before, but I can't think about it off the top of my head. But uh, I I think it is a nice mix of the two that you can get some story because, I mean, a huge part of Drinkbox games is the humor. And I can see like how that's kind of uh, working its way into this game. Mostly, I think, from what I could see, uh, obviously there's the, the, the broad humor about like changing forms and being a rat and stuff like that. But, you know, the menus and quests seem like they have a lot of humor embedded in them as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's always background art that has humor in drink box games. So I'm assuming there's going to be some of that. I didn't catch anything in the stream today. I don't know if there was any Easter eggs like that, Graham. Not on the stream today, no. But no? there's okay. definitely some of that in the, in the game, yeah. Which you're kind of known for, I think, at this yeah. point. Yeah. yeah. Um, and... I don't know. I just like, I think it's a very interesting hybrid concept. I love rogue likes and lights lately. So uh, I'm really excited and we'll talk about the games that we saw today. Just in general, 
they all look amazing. Like art styles and indie games have never been better. It's almost like a jumping off point that you need to have for your game. And every game I saw today was like, wow, that looks interesting. I am into that. <laughs> like, I don't know if the gameplay works. I have questions about the story and writing for a lot of the games. That seems to be where some of these games kind of fall off for me in terms of interest level. But uh, with your game, I can say like the gameplay, I've said this with trailers. I don't know if I know how to play this game. I think I know how to play this game based on your trailer. And uh, I, I think the gameplay looks fun. And the uh, I love the skill tree. I think it looks very like highly usable and interesting and looks amazing. So I, I don't know if you're getting that kind of feedback on the skill tree. Uh, yeah, the skill tree is something that just came in a couple of weeks ago. So I'm really glad to hear that. Oh yeah. Before that, uh, yeah, the skill tree was really bad for, for a long time, but uh, yeah, we definitely spruced it up for the, uh, for the demo. Yeah. Yeah. I've... It's all... Sorry, go ahead, Andrew. Oh, I was just going to say, I have a question, but if you were going to go off on the skill tree, go, go for it. Uh, yeah, I, 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 like the skill tree is one of the very first things that got designed for the project because uh, uh, our, our concept lead, uh, Augusto, he's the guy, same person who pitched Guacamole initially. He, uh, he did this concept art of this crazy skill tree. That, like, it, looked, it was like a hand-drawn skill tree. Um, for a long time in the game, we had this really shitty, like, very menu-driven programmery skill tree. Now we're trying to start to shift towards his really cool initial design. And what you're seeing right now is kind of a step towards that. I think it's going to get even better. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I had two questions, one about the procedural dungeons and one about just sort of like drink box pedigree, I guess that you call it or something. Uh, so I'll do that one first. But so Frank kind of touched on it that you guys are known for the kind of humor and stuff. You also have like a pretty identifiable art style now it seemed like people were saying this doesn't have your art style in it but i could totally see it like, i mean it's not the same vector graphics but you can see the palette is pretty similar to other games or at least i thought it was the hand-drawn art style is obviously different but i still saw the style the drink box style in there which i was happy to see uh but my real question is you guys are known for you know platformers basically uh <laughs> was it hard to kind of break away from that and what what has been really different about working on not a pro uh, not a platformer it's a good question um it's i mean it's hard in some ways and it's it's easy in other ways uh it's i mean the nice thing about doing it the the, the easy part of it is that you get re you really get sick of working on the same kind of game when you've been working on it for so long and uh, with we like just before this, we shipped Guacamole 2, and that's like a sequel. So even doubly so, you're kind of like exhausted with platformers by the and, right? and there was many versions of Guac as well, right? Yeah, like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the team just wants to work on something completely different. So I mean, the the bad thing is when you jump into something completely new like this, you don't have the tech in your engine for it. So we didn't have like any tile based uh, system at all. The all the levels in this game are all tile based or the procedural generation um so so there's like all this new tech and then there's a whole bunch of new gameplay problems that you need to solve that you've never had to deal with before right and you know the kind of things that we had to deal with on this project that have been pretty challenging are like well when you find an amazing synergy with like you pull in these moves from these different classes and you're like super powerful how how do you stop the player from just keeping that thing for the rest of the game right so and so the, a lot of our design decisions have been, you know, around trying to like push players to keep trying new things, right? So the way that the quests are given to the different forms and the way that the dungeons have different things that are that are what more well suited to some forms than others. That's that, those are the kind of solutions that we come up with. Well, I think um, that's an elegant solution. Uh, like I think Zelda Breath of the Wild, its way of doing that is by stuff like destroying weapons or having lifetimes on weapons. And yes. I think that's a frustrating way of using systems like that uh, to encourage a variety. And I think your decision is much more interesting and uh, I'm excited for Thank it. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In our game, if you try and just stay as the same thing, you just, uh, you just stop progressing at, at some point or you'll just start failing on a dungeon. So you, you're given really no choice, but thankfully it's fun to switch because you get like a completely different gameplay. And that's another thing that we do. We really, we really don't like. Well, I'll I'll say I'll say I don't like uh, games like Diablo. Even though I just 
I, I played a lot of Diablo, but I just get bored really quickly. It's fun to play Diablo with a friend and you're just like, you know, chatting while you're doing it, but it starts to become a grind for me or, or even these like 80 hour long RPGs when it's like, oh, this area is too hard. I got to go back to this other area and grind for an hour by just fighting the same enemies over and over. So we didn't want to have a game like that. So now in our game, if you ever, if you ever get tired of playing as something, it's like you have 20 other options. Like you're just going to completely change up your gameplay. It's kind of like um, if you've played Hades, if you, if you get sick as, of, of playing like a particular weapon in Hades, you take a different weapon and it feels like completely different or you just take different perks on your way, right? So, um, so yeah, just refreshing the, the gameplay is, is something that uh, really helps get rid of the grinding feeling of, of RPGs. Yeah, I mean, as a, <clears throat> as a designer, the thing I was kind of worried about uh, is how you switch forms and combine forms because lots of games have tried to do that and even Ori, the sequel to Ori, you would um, <clears throat> have to map abilities. And I found that actually not fun. So have you worked or experimented with how to make that fast or interesting and not cumbersome? Because I find that's a, an issue with games like that sometimes. Yeah. Um, so we, we let you customize every one of your forms individually. So it'll remember your customization, your loadout, okay. if you ever switch back. And then we also have like this quick swap wheel where if you hold down a button, your last eight are available. So you can, you can be switching really quickly on the fly if you want to. Um, but we don't actually encourage that. We like, we like, I think the best way to play the game is like you're about to go into a dungeon. You can see what you're going to have to deal with. You make your build, you try it. If you fail, you come back out, you know, you, you try something different. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so it's not like you're not like constantly switching on the fly, although you can do that. Um, but but uh, the, it feels better to like you know push through, fail, and do it another another time with a different build. Yeah. Uh, my follow up, kind of related to the to dungeons, actually, is you mentioned there's 25 dungeons procedurally generated. 25 alone seems like a big number, uh, <laughs> just as, just from sheer content amount, and the fact that they're procedurally generated obviously makes them unlimited unlimited replayability now is there reasons to go back to the dungeons like do you have quests that cause you to return to dungeons or is it mainly if you die it doesn't get stale in that regard uh both um so yeah primarily uh primarily it's just when you die you don't have to play the same content again um but um but more recently, we've been adding a lot more like side quests and stuff in, in, uh, into the game. And there are definitely a lot of side quests that send you into a dungeon to do something particular like, oh, uh, like if there's a dungeon that's a prison and like the Thieves Guild enlists you to rescue one of their members from the prison. Or um, I don't know, there's a, there's a bunch of examples of things like that. And then, you know, there's also like, we also have a lot of those side quests that don't send you to dungeons. They also send you to do like other custom challenges um like one-off things like we have an archery range like in the old zelda style where it's like there's targets and stuff and you got to do that as the as the ranger right uh so yeah cool sounds like the game is going to be quite long (laughs) well yeah it's it's definitely our longest game um we just uh uh we just had the whole team play through the game recently and it it's like for me, it took about 12 hours to beat, um, and some people up to like 20 hours, and that's much longer than any of our previous games. So, mm-hmm. and I, I'll say that this is the fourth time I played through the whole game, and I didn't really feel bored. So, that's a good sign. I, I <laughs> by the end, of, but by the end of the project, I probably will. Uh, <laughs> but I, yeah, like, but generally, it feels like this one for me. It has more staying power than our other games. Like I played through Guacamole so many times, and I'd like. Eventually, you just want to kill yourself when you're when you're doing another run through. But this one, just because of the variety and the customization and stuff, there's more uh, more room for creativity, which makes it feel less uh, I don't know cumbersome, tedious. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, was looking at I was like I was looking at my Steam uh, account, which I <laughs> didn't even I don't even think I used for all the development when I did it for Steam, and it was an insane amount of hours. And yeah. I think I even had a Drinkbox <laughs> account that had even more. So, jeez. But I mean, that's the appeal of not that this is a roguelite, a roguelike necessarily, but just that randomness and, you know, every run being unique or different or one more run. I could see that applying to this game. But one thing I didn't mention was the uh, protagonist, Nobody, uh, which is like just kind of a generic 
be, is it a soul? Like, uh, do you, are you, do you want to say anything about that or was it in the video and I missed? No, we didn't, we don't really explain what nobody is. Okay. I didn't um, think just that you start up, you, you wake up at the start of the game, uh, you find this wand and, the, and it's the wand of this famous wizard, Nostromagus, yeah. who's recently gone missing. And he's usually the one who, Nostromagus is usually the one who comes down and saves the world, right? Uh, but he's gone. So it's your turn to, to, to try and do it. Uh, but you're contending against his apprentice, Randy, who, who really wants a shot to prove himself. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so Randy's a bit of a jerk. He locks you up right at the start of the game. And then you find the wand and you use it to escape. And then Randy keeps encountering you, trying to get the wand back from you. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, there was so much stuff in that trailer. Like, I'm looking at screenshots right now, and there's this, like, looks like a, a, a dealer kind of a potion dealer. <laughs> yeah, that's it. The fairies that are in the world. Pinkolino yeah. that are like <laughs> pushing potions and stuff like that. So uh, yeah. I don't know. I, I miss I miss already. some of this stuff on the, <laughs> in, in the trailer, and it looks pretty funny. Yeah, I watched the trailer at like 0. 0.2 speed. Like I, I, had this, like, <laughs> I was trying to like catch everything. There was just so much packed into the trailer. It was it was a little overwhelming to watch it at regular speed and and catch it all. <clears throat> yeah, I do we, like the quest system. It looks really good. The the the, on the left, how it pops out, like that looks very slick. And I love when games track quests like that. It Thank just you. makes me happy. Yeah. Yeah, you need to go, yeah. You need to you need to pay a lot of attention to your quests so it makes sense to have them always easily available. I interrupted you though. I think you were going to say something. Uh, yeah, I don't remember what I was going to say. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. So, I, I mean, I don't know if we're wrapping up the, the questions here, but I was just curious because, you know, you guys, you didn't really announce a release date, but you said kind of coming soon. Um, I mean, I don't know, I guess it's open to interpre interpretation what that means, but I was just Soon -ish, curious. We, we've talked about the fact that, you know, the difference between like announcing a game like years out and then, you know, announcing a game and dropping it next week or something and sort of the strategies there i mean it seems like these days it, it, everybody's feeling like it's beneficial to hold back as much as you can do you agree with that you mean sort of strategy to announce closer to your launch yeah uh i think there's a sweet spot it's like you cannot you can definitely do it too late and and launch your game and it just gets missed yeah. and, and if you do it like that you don't get as many attempts at like you know pushing new like pushing news about the game and agree gaining awareness, right? Um, and then on the flip side, and we've done this on, on our some of our games too, it's possible to announce too early and then the press gets tired about talking about it and they're just like, just give us the game. We want to see the game. Uh, so it's, um, but yeah, I, I feel like the sweet spot is like around six months. Um, for us, we're, we're trying to launch in about five or six months. That's, that's about where we're at right now. Um, although we're still putting a lot of stuff in the game and it feels like it's still getting better, we're not going to want to cut it off as long as it feels like the game is still getting better and we're putting cool stuff in, um, we're going to keep doing that. But, um, but right now we're kind of targeting like around August, uh, end of summer time frame. Yeah. So that's what five months. And I think I it's worth mentioning it. that, uh, in the, there was a montage at the end of the presentation that said this will be game pass day one or play day one, I think was the, the term that they used. And I think like a lot of these games are, coming out on game pass and Sean has mentioned this before and probably Andrew as well. Like Xbox is starting to take over that, uh, that indie cred or indie champion that PlayStation had for such a long time. So, uh, the, the indie games on game pass are really good and there's lots of cool variety on there. So I'm pumped to have it on there. Yeah. I'm curious, like if you have any thoughts on, what game pass can do or, or means for like in terms of getting a wider audience for your game or anything like that like that's a good uh, question i mean th this is the first time we're launching a game into game pass so it'll be interesting to see um if like it, like is it going to affect sales on pc is it good, like I, i'm not sure like what's the crossover uh of game pass owners and uh but uh, but but uh, I, I still think like from a consumer standpoint, Game Pass is an amazing value, and definitely it means more people are going to end up playing this game that wouldn't have bought it otherwise, right? So um, yeah. there's going to be de definitely some knock-on benefit. Like maybe maybe they'll play this game and they'll be like, oh, I really like this game, and what else does this developer made? And maybe we'll sell more copies of Guacamelee based off that. You know? Well, Guac was on Game Pass at some point, or two was, right? Like yeah. 
Uh, you notice any benefits to that or was it anything interesting that came out of having it on there? Yeah, I mean, it's really hard to say because you, you can't really compare with not putting it in Game Pass and like how did your mm-hmm. sales on other platforms do and how would they have done otherwise? Um, for for us, like when they when they put you in Game Pass, you get like a, a, a lump sum payment, right? Uh, so basically kind of buy you out. I think that's like how Netflix works and stuff too, in generally. But so we just, uh, whenever we do it, we just do the math and we take some guesses. We're like, does it make sense? Do we think we're going to lose? Like, would we have made these sales? Uh, is this better than we would have done otherwise? And it's just, and you know, we you, you do your best guess, you make some estimates and uh, and if, if it looks like it's going to be in your favor, you, you take the deal. Um, but it's always great to see people playing your game that wouldn't have played it otherwise, because uh, it is a good way to get new fans and get them to buy your next game. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I don't think I had any other major stuff to cover with the game. Did anyone else have any questions for Graham? No, I think that's it for me. No. Graham, anything you wanted to talk about that we didn't get to or a feature or anything? I was sick of talking like about this game. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, it's, we, I think we covered pretty much everything. Uh, okay. can, you, can you maybe just say where people can find information if they want it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, there, we, we, there's a new website we just launched today. That's another thing that's been keeping me busy. Uh, it's nobodysavestheworld.com. Uh, and we also started a Discord I guess everyone has a Discord now, uh, but yeah, uh, discord.gg slash drinkbox. So yeah, feel free to join there. We'll be posting updates uh, as they come. Very cool. cool. Website's beautiful. Thank you. I did not make this website. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, Graham. Thanks for uh, giving us some interesting insights on the game. I. I think I speak for all three of us when I say I'm very excited for this game and always look forward to new games from Drinkbox Studios, one of my favorite developers. Thank you. And I guess it's worth saying, like, if it wasn't for Graham, I wouldn't even be doing this podcast right now. I know I said it every time you <laughs> but he basically got me in the video game industry, and I, I, mean, I didn't do anything. Eternally great. <laughs> Thanks, Frank. Well, thank you, Graham. One of the best guys around. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about the ID at Xbox stuff uh, a little bit. Just like I said, I thought everything looked really good. Like, uh, there was a couple of, I'm not into turn-based strategy uh, games that those kind of fell flat for me here and there, but everything else I think had a, like an amazing art style, cool concepts. Um, some of the ones that stood out to me were definitely, uh, even though, I think the name got mixed up a couple times on the stream song of iron, which was this highly stylized uh, kind of brooding Viking game, which remind me a bit of not in looks or gameplay, but ideas. Uh, Did anyone play Volgar? It was one of the the first Xbox one games with gold. It's like a very difficult, like uh, 16 bit Viking game. And just the way the character moved, it just get, reminded me of that game. And that was one of the best ones to me. Also, um, the Death's Door, which oh, is yeah. for the people who did, um, I can't, I lost it. The um, Titan Souls, I think. Did they do that? I thought they just said the game was like that game. No, I think they developed Titan Souls, I'm pretty sure. Oh, really? Yeah, that game looked really good. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. oh, they did Banner Saga as well. Acid Nerve, it looks like, is the company that did it. Yep. So I thought that looked amazing. Um, the. Yeah, you're right. They did do Titan Souls. Yeah, they did do Titan Souls. You're One right. of the extended conversations was about a game called Moon Glow Bay, which was a fishing game that I thought looked really cool. Uh, the other extended talk was Soup Pot, I think, which was this weird cooking game, which I love the art style. Like when you see the cut meat and it's got like the the glisten on it and like the texture for the meat, I thought it looked absolutely amazing. Yeah, I guess it's not VR, about. right? Because it's on Xbox, but it seemed like a VR game. So anyway, sorry, how go ahead. I was just going to say, it looked like they took like real world pictures of the stuff and then put it in this kind of like faux yeah it's like 
it's photogrammetry, but like then they put a style pass on it or something like that. Like it, it looked really interesting. I don't know if I got the gameplay necessarily, uh, but I was intrigued by it. And another one, the one other one I was probably the most excited for was, is it Navita boy? Narita boy. Narita boy. Sorry. My, my, yeah. note, my R looks like a V, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I com- comes out next week. I think. Oh, oh really? Yes. That looks yeah, awesome. 20, 29th of March. There was another game I'm missing too that had a a similar futuristic look. I don't know if I, I I like the look of Loot River. I don't know if that's kind of what you're thinking of. It wasn't really futuristic. It was more like post-apocalyptic kind of, I guess. But um, but sort of same kind of pixel art, but like kind of um, kind of violent looking, and I was intrigued. Yeah, they have that. What's it called? Like a plague doctor. That, you played as like a plague doctor, right? That that yeah. like triangular mask kind of thing. I just know it from Darkest Dungeon. I think they call it a plague doctor in Darkest Dungeon. I can't think of what it. I think that was in one called. of the Assassin's Creed games too. Mm-hmm. Oh, was it? Yeah. yeah, I'm pretty sure it is. What game was that? That was. That was Loot River. That, that was, was Loot one River. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, that did look good. I, that looked really awesome. Um, I thought Huck would be into Astria Ascending, which seemed to get a lot of exposure. During the- yeah, it was giving me a lot of like Odin Sphere, uh, Miramasa vibes. Uh, definitely, definitely, I couldn't totally tell what it was. It looked like it was maybe an RPG, but I don't know. It was a so turn based totally- JRPG. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, I think, the writers of some of the Final Fantasy games and Vagrant Story, I think. I, th- I think you like Vagrant Story, or I assume you do. I don't know if you actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that seemed right up your alley and some other big games i think were the wild at heart which looked like a bit of a don't starve uh pikmin mashup from what i could tell um the ascent which was talked about before which was a kind of a twin stick shooter isometric type game that was cyberpunk yeah cyberpunk it was part of one of the original xbox showcases that i was excited for that got pushed um, it, it had some really incredible inf- effects and environments in that trailer. Like it really wait. stood out. I mean, Graham, I'll, maybe I'll defer to you. Was there anything, did you have any favorite stuff that, uh, out of that video or the stuff you were really excited about? I didn't really get a chance to watch cause oh, yeah, yeah, I was like, <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> but as you've been saying them, I've been like looking at the videos. Uh, I did see, uh, I did see death's door and song of iron. Those two look both, both look really amazing. Yeah. Uh, the first vi- one was Exomecha, which was clearly to me kind of a halo meets crisis or far cry, but then they had this mech battle element involved. It actually had a grapple mechanic that looked almost identical to the one from halo infinite in that video we talked yeah. about a while ago. And, uh, apparently Graham, you're saying this is a Canadian company. Echo Mecca. No, 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 no. Oh, I was no. talking about echo the generation. Oh, yeah. <laughs> echo generation. <laughs> well, I How many times are we going to get that one mixed up? <laughs> I thought you said this one was too. Sorry. I, I knew you said that about echo generation, but, uh, yeah, I, I, I thought Exo Mecca looked interesting. It just, I mean, it clearly seems like an influence of a lot of other games, which isn't necessarily bad. Um, yeah. I thought it was a little heavy on the screen shake effects and the particle effects in general just seem to be going everywhere. I had a, and also every character seemed to be silver, which yeah. made it really hard for me to identify like, who are you trying to fight? Are they yeah. on your team? Are they not on your team? I'm not really sure. And then you start getting into bigger vehicles and they're also all silver. So it must have some sort of story aspect. And it seemed like some of them had like a, an orange tint, some had a blue tint. So obviously that must be the team, but it was very hard to identify, especially when you're moving so quickly. Um, I don't know that I I'm questioning that art choice as far as like the readability of enemy characters, unless it's just a free for all game and you're basically just out there to kill everybody. I don't know. It didn't seem like that though. Yeah. I mean, it looked pretty good. Um, Omno, which seemed to, a bit like Little Devil to me and a few other games combined that are coming out. Uh, I saw elements of the Pathless in there as well. And there's another game. I can't, I can never remember the title of it that I was playing on Steam a bit. Uh, but it reminded me of the Dash mechanic, which is basically the main mechanic in the game. Let me look this up. Definitely gave me the Pathless vibes. Yeah, with 
and that's another thing. A lot of these games seem to be, you know, we need to do locomotion and there's examples out there and they seem to be borrowing from each other. There was another game. I can't remember which one that again was a, a very uh, breath of the wild influence. Like the gliding looked like identical to it. I can't remember. Yeah, Was that craftopia? I think it was, I think it was craftopia. Um, oh, blue fire was the game that it reminded me of a bit. Omno. And I think that was the major stuff that I had that I was, really intrigued by not to say the other stuff didn't look interesting um lost oasis i thought looked pretty good uh and exo one another mashup game i totally thought that was gonna be like a mad max meets dune sandwor- sandworm game because i'm pretty sure that's that's what it was right if i recall that was the one with the dune sandworms in it uh is this the one that's already out like on early access or something Oh, I thought one game was... Is that the game that's coming April 29th to Early Access? Oh, maybe that's what it... Lost Oasis is out now, I think. Oh, it is? Okay. Yeah, just looking at the trailer, and I think that... Yeah, yeah. launched today. Yeah. yeah, it looks cool, though. It is the Sandworm one. Okay, that's out <clears> today? <throat> yeah, it looks like. I'm in. I'll check that out. So it, I'll just... It does say Early Access on Steam. Yeah, Sean, get to your get to your thing. Well, you, I mean, you mentioned a lot of the big ones uh last stop kind of i was intrigued by i don't know if that one's been shown before but it's an annapurna game kind of um you know story-based adventure type thing um i think the same people who made virginia you played that right oh really yeah i liked virginia a lot the gameplay looked really good i think they really wanted to show like how you play this game which i thought turned out quite well yeah i i had kind of the opposite reaction. I thought it looked really slow and almost like uh, they were trying to do like a heavy rain style input, but uh, kind of exaggerated. I don't know. I didn't feel like that really worked that well with heavy rain. Hmm, maybe it's because Sean and I were playing a way out and the quick time events looked more interesting than a way out. So. <laughs> uh, maybe. Yep. <laughs> sure. Oh, well, we have to mention hello neighbor too which was featuring cloud driven AI, which Huck is all about. And <laughs> there was the yeah, drive avatars yeah. for Forza that were using the same technology. And it really hasn't come back since this game. It's time. It's time. It's been too long. <laughs> Machine learning. Got to get those buzzwords in there. You know, uh, the thing with hello neighbor, like, honestly, it's weird. Cause like, you know, it's a game that uh, the kids are kind of into and I'm aware of it and I've seen it and I've played it a bit, but it, like it never it had potential but I, it never really grabbed me and this one seems interesting in that i think they're expanding it so that you can like talk to people around town and stuff too like it's not just the house but focusing all on the ai was a weird choice like i didn't i don't know i didn't like is that why people play hello neighbor like to try and get adaptive ai response i don't know it's weird but i've never played it either uh I didn't realize it has sold so much. Like I knew this game it's, had some sort of cult following. It's huge for streaming, right? I knew it had some sort of cult following because it's everywhere. Like it, they have so many iterations, but uh, I'm reading this thing that says the franchise, so I don't know how many games there are, has been downloaded as 30 million players. Like that's oh, yeah. insane. I didn't realize it was that big. I thought, you know, maybe a couple million, maybe five high end, but 30. That's great. Cra- oh, there's a book series. Yeah, there's oh toys. Oh, wow. It's crazy. I didn't realize this was so large. Wow. So um, yeah, who cares? Machine learning. Who cares? That's all you need. <laughs> yeah. So no, I'm going to talk about lawn mowing. Well, simulator. I was just going to bring it up. You got to talk lawn mowing simulator. Now this was just an announcement trailer, Game I guess. Game of the show. Game of the show. But <laughs> very weird thing for me because I so there was an old. Commodore 64 game. Oh, here we go. Here we <laughs> called go. Called Lawn. And all it was was you were just like a square and you just had to try and like cover like the entire surface basically. And I was all I always had this joke with a friend of mine that, you know, when I get into game development, I have to do a remake of Lawn, like a 3D remake of Lawn. And then I saw that today. I'm like, man, somebody actually did it. I can't believe it. <laughs> So I'm very curious if they've ever played Lawn. But, uh, I mean, you know, it's obviously one of these kind of quirky 
games that's going to sell based on how weird it is and streamers are going to love it. But I'm a little curious. Out of all the simulators and weird simulators, this is the one I'm most intrigued by. <laughs> will be these, purposely... these have got to be the same guys that did like uh, Truck Simulator and Farming Simulator, right? I don't know. Does anyone I mean, it's I, certainly I the, so, yeah. the logo and stuff looks very similar to those, but I don't actually know. Skyhook Games. Let's see. Uh, I don't. I, don't, I didn't get that vibe necessarily. Oh, uh, it says announced by. Kirk. They did Train Simulator, so they did one of them at least. There was a couple train games too, wasn't there? There was a. Uh... Void, Void train. Train. train and that was a weird one. Yeah, that one I had trouble understanding. I didn't get it. Yeah, what that I, game was about. It looked cool. I just I was like I don't know what this is. Rust is a, coming to consoles, which I've never played. I don't know much about it. Uh, I think that game is huge on PC. Rust. Yeah. yeah I, my only other comment on the whole thing was something I've talked about before. I'm gonna go on a little rant here. Um, the titles for the games. Number one. They all have these crazy typefaces. I couldn't read it. The streamers covering the event got the titles wrong because of it. Like, we were debating, is it Omno? I think they had said Omni. Like, I don't understand. I know you want a cool logo for your game, but, like, it should be readable in some form. Like, it shouldn't be a struggle. I would think half of the battle of being an indie game is getting people to know and recognize your game and standing out. And if you, you don't remember the title, that's a huge thing. And... I've said this before too. Why aren't these games putting the title of their game before the trailer? I don't care what the name of your company is. I, I couldn't care less. I want to cement these images with a name that I want to buy and pre-order, not wait till the end and then forget what the title is. Like how is the call to action not to like remember this game, especially when you have an amazing art style? I It's so weird to me. I, I don't know. I don't know why people don't do it. I would flash the title of my game right away or put the Twitter handle. Some games did this up during the the trailer or something like that. I don't get it. It's it's mind-boggling to me. I agree. I think we've ripped on this before. Okay, I just it, every trailer yeah. I'm seeing the same thing today. I'm like I want to know what this game is. I don't know what it is and then I know too late. So Yeah, especially well, I mean I Oh, go ahead, Sean. Oh, I was just going to say, I think Graham's got to respond to it. I mean, he just had a trailer debut today. So. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree. We didn't do it. I know, Frank, I'm sorry. But, uh... but you had a lead in. You had a lead in on Twitch. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We had a lead in on Twitch, and we did, we put a, we decided to put from the developers of Guacamelee instead yeah. of putting Drinkbox, because no one knows who Drinkbox is, but people recognize Guacamelee. Um, but yeah, I've, I've had a similar problem, like listen, just listening to like gaming podcasts where you know, you're like, you're, I'm walking the dog or something. And then I hear them talking about the game and I'm like, oh, this sounds amazing. And then they just continue on the conversation. And I'm like, what game was that? And then you're like rewinding back to the start of the conversation when yeah. you're trying to find the spot where they mentioned the name of the game. So I think you're right. It, it needs to be bookended, Frank, before it's and after. Bookended. I think so too. <laughs> and it's like, I think it's just a, it was games copying movies, right? Where, but movie marketing is way, like there's less movies in theaters and you see the same trailer or you used to at theaters a million times. So it's like you get that repetition with games. There's way more competition and they all look good. So like you, uh, it's just, it's a weird uh, legacy thing for trailers. And I can't believe no one's breaking the mold here. But uh, anyway, that's my right over. I was going to say, especially on the like teasers they're showing where you get literally like, 10 seconds or less like i mean obviously you're not going to show your name there but why not put a little uh like twitter handle in the corner or something of those you know at least then people can you know easily rewind sometimes they have the little lo uh, name in the corner but sometimes they don't uh so if you get like such a little amount of time you you sh you'd think you'd want to make sure that the name is somewhere in there i mean 10 and seconds the not twitch probably. streamers that were hosting actually brought up potentially the counterpoint for this idea but i also think it's a point for my what i'm proposing which was the cuphead the first announcement of cuphead where i remember seeing that and i'm like what is that i need to know right now it was like a five seconds and i eventually found it i was at work when e3 was on and 
their website was down. It was getting flooded with requests. <laughs> so uh, I wasn't the only one. And those Twitch broad, uh, broadcasters had the exact same experience, <laughs> which makes a lot of sense now. Uh, but if you put your name on it, you don't even need that. Like it's, it's just, it's going to happen. I just, like, you know, you want to pull people in, you want to intrigue people. I, sometimes just dropping a name that nobody's heard of. I don't know if that catches your attention right away, but let me, let me have a counter proposal for you. What about halfway through the trailer, <laughs> you show your title. And then again, at the end, you show your title. I don't know. I, I, I agree with Graham. <laughs> My, I don't care as much about having it on all the time, but book ending, I think is a good thing to do. And don't book it unless you're, you know, one of the best developers in the world and you're teasing your new game, then I would say, okay, say who you are. And of course there's trailers where the reveal is the title at the end for big franchises, which that's a whole nother thing. But for these smaller games, just let me take it in. Let me make strong associations in my uh, brain that I will carry forward to the store that I choose to buy it on or both stores so I can get achievements and trophies. <laughs> won't be on the switch though i will not be buying it on the switch you'll be back don't worry you'll be back um i i just wanted to say i like i kind of uh wanted to echo what you said at the very beginning just that i thought overall it was just like a super exciting kind of press event where i was just like man there are a lot of cool games being made and like yeah some of these games might not turn out to be amazing but like the fact that i hopefully can try a lot of them on game pass like that's amazing. So very exciting. Yes. And my like fanboyism towards Sony is pretty much towards AAA games and like major titles, right? Uh, game pass is an amazing value. I play it all the time. And uh, like if you're just into games and if it's a, basically a parent that's looking for something, I just tell them, you know, get game pass and uh, they'll have Minecraft. They can play Fortnite for free and you're good to go. So when I'm saying I'm all about Sony, that's like from someone who is playing every game, needs to play every game, and wants to play the best of the best games, which I think are on Sony for the most part. All right. Uh, I, got a, I got a couple more games. If, okay, uh, cool. Go to wrap it. this up. Uh, one game I actually worked on a little bit was shown in this, uh, a game called Chivalry 2, which is a game by a studio out of Toronto called Torn Banner Studios. It's a, like a military, military medieval battlefield simulator game, and it comes out June 8th. So uh, go look that one up if you guys missed that trailer. It looked really good, actually, I thought. Yeah, and just to add on to that, a lot of these games seem like they're coming out pretty soon. I was not aware of that. There wasn't a lot of dates within the presentation itself, uh, but I'm there's a few the next few months. I'm pretty yeah. excited. Okay, sorry, what was the other game, Huck? Uh, there was a couple. So actually, going back, that Wild at Heart game, you were trying to think of a game that reminded you of it. Was it Knights and Bikes? Do you remember that like uh, Double Fine game, Knights and Bites? Bikes? No, it was, I mean, Wild at Heart, I thought, I think I said, reminded me of uh, Don't Starve. Don't Starve and Pikmin. Like, there was a, a huge Pikmin okay. in that game. But maybe uh, art style you're talking about? Yeah, art I, style. I did think maybe it was a double flying game. Like, it kind of reminded me a little of Costume Quest as well. Just I don't game. even remember the game Nights and Bikes. Well, look it up. Yeah, it looked, that's, it I me think that's it. on Game Pass right now. That's another co op game we got to stream, Frank. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, a couple others stood out from like the teasers section where they, they it was kind of near the beginning there was a game called uh iron i don't know if i wrote this down but iron corbo kung fu janitor do you guys remember seeing this one it was like yeah. this weird kind of like janitor guy doing some kung fu moves i thought it kind of looked kind of interesting uh that echo generation was in here that graham was mentioning and that looks really interesting it's like a voxel art style with rpg battles and um almost like like some other action mechanics as well it was kind of hard to tell exactly what the gameplay was um this one i thought you were going to be all over frank alba a wildlife adventure where it's oh the bird photography yeah i did yeah that looked no, that went that one's on uh, apple arcade already is oh, it is it yeah download it right now Check it out. <laughs> uh what else let's see here um oh lake which looked almost like a mail delivery simulator, but kind of 
more story driven. I thought, Dwight, you'd like that one if you thought that um, whatever that game they showed at the end was uh, Last Stop. It kind of looked similar to that. It almost reminded me of like, um, uh, oh, what's the game that we were talking about last week? Uh, not Tell Me Why. The same guys. Um, oh, boy. Oh, uh, Life is Strange? Life is Strange, yeah. Kind of reminded <laughs> me of Life is Strange this game lake uh which i thought looked really nice uh let's see here oh and they also had that D dark alliance game in this little teaser section as well i also yeah. thought that that craft craft craftotopia game looked craft basically like yeah craft-topia. breath of the wild with pokemon elements and farming sim elements and city builder elements El- yeah everything it just looked like Let's throw everything at the wall and just do it all. Uh, I think that's it. It looks like Craftopia is on early access on Steam currently. Hmm. Yeah, it looks cool. Lots of stuff. Blaster Master Maybe, Zero Three. Oh yeah, you, Sean. I too much stuff. Talking about Blaster Master. I thought Dwight would be all over. Uh, I already played it. It's been out on the Switch for a while. Oh, cool. Oh, really? Oh, geez. But the only game that matters is Nobody Saves the World. Forget all the <laughs> other pieces of garbage. Don't have to worry about them. Just stop. I, I must say, though, uh, from watching the stream, there was a lot of times when the Twitch streamers would just bring up Nobody Saves the World, just kind of like when they were talking about the other games that are being shown and about the conversations that were going on in the Twitch chat. So oh, obviously... Yeah, the host. So obviously oh. it struck a nerve with some of the people that were watching, not just us. Awesome. So that's good uh, for you, Graham, to know that, that people were actually <laughs> talking about it and bringing it up. Every extra little bit of buzz helps, you know? Definitely, yeah. All right, well, I think we should get into what we played. Uh, anyone want to go first? Graham, maybe I'll defer to the guest. Anything yeah, sure. playing that you want to talk about? Uh, how far back am I supposed to go? Back to my last appearance? There's a long list. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, uh, I bought uh, It Takes Two. Have you, I don't know if you guys have talked about that game yet. But no, we have not. I uh, just saw some reviews coming out last night. I'm like, oh, I got to play this game. Uh, it's like a co-op platformer. Mm-hmm. Um, th- I don't know. I really don't know what it's about yet, but it uh, looks really cool. Um, uh, Is it a married couple or something like that? Is that? part of the, the thing yeah the, cool. the story i think is about a married couple who's going through troubles and they're working through their troubles together uh yeah i also just started playing death stranding this week i'm a little bit late to the party on that one you guys played that game super I, weird I 10 hours of it something like that i was texting with graham a bit before this and i'm about where you are i think when i stop playing and i downloaded it thinking i was going to play it some more before this but i didn't um I, I'm only just scratching the surface, I think, but uh, I like a lot of the weird stuff. I'm just not sure if the gameplay is going to keep me like carrying packages across America. It doesn't feel like the most amazing gameplay, but we'll see. So far, it's still pretty interesting. The presentation is amazing, though, like the music and... Oh, yeah, it's gorgeous. Uh, absolutely, yeah. And the character design, like the the, the tech is incredible. Um, yeah. Uh, and then I guess recently I played, uh, I played Little Nightmares 2, I don't know if I answered that. Uh, Deep Rock Galactic. That would be a good co-op game if you haven't played that. It's on Game Pass. Yeah, yeah that was beside uh, us at PAX East, I think, when I was there for Embers of Miram, and they were uh, they had a pretty cool booth. That game's been around for a long time, and it's definitely you know pretty popular. I had a lot of fun playing co-op in that game. Okay, um, cool. And I just, just tried it randomly on Game Pass. I didn't know anything about it, but it's, uh, it's like you and your co-op buddies, you're flying to asteroids and and like kind of you're digging through chambers and collecting resources and you're being attacked by monsters at the same time you're trying to reach certain resource goals and then get back to your ship and take off um so it's, it's pretty fun and then you back in the base you upgrade your equipment and you go do harder missions and it's one of those kind of loops i feel um, like i heard that compared to like left for dead that kind of style of co-op game left for dead yeah it's a little bit like left for dead uh it's it, uh, except like, I guess you're, tr- you're mainly trying to harvest resources and fend off attacks. Um, yeah. yeah. It, was, it was a little more, it reminded me of like a horde mode kind of game as well. Right. Yeah. Pro- progressing through something necessarily. Exactly. Yeah. Cause you like, you're, you're digging deeper and deeper into this 
asteroid. And then at the end, you got to get back to your ship and you're being chased by monsters. And it's pretty fun. Uh, well, that sounds a bit like Left 4 Dead. Yeah. Um, and then Hades. Pretty awesome game, I thought. Um, yeah. I didn't, like, it took me a long time to get to that one as well. But uh, when I finally started it, it got me right away. I really loved the, the gameplay. It really, really hooked me. Graham, if you if you got your Game Pass, I know you've heard me talk about it, but Scourgebringer, you got to give it a shot. Scourgebringer, it's going on yeah. the list. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, mandatory. Me, one of the most underrated games out there right now. Really? Yeah. I, I haven't heard of it, so that's that's cool. Um, then uh, I'll just I won't go too much farther. I pl- I, I played the uh, the new Ori uh, when that came out on Switch. I really love that game. Um, so so beautiful. Um, and uh, Manifold Garden, which is like which I tried because you had told me about it. Yeah, it's uh, it's weird. Uh, <laughs> uh, I really <laughs> liked it. I thought it got, I thought it got uh, got better and better as it was going on, like the new mechanics and everything, and definitely a mindfuck game. Uh, oh yeah, <laughs> it made me feel really dumb. I yeah. haven't felt that stupid in a long time. Um, that guy who made that game, he streamed like the whole development on Twitch, and I'm sure it's archived somewhere to see it. Uh, I watched a few of the steam- streams here and there, but it was not very entertaining to watch someone <laughs> face things in a level editor. Hmm. Especially when it's that trippy, because his, his setup in Unity was so customized to his game that you couldn't even tell really what he was doing because it was like this nested, like, cubes within cubes and all this weird stuff going on it was kind of hard to tell what <laughs> was even looking at right with playing the game so uh yeah it's kind of interesting the Why game not? is definitely weird it's like uh one of the er- early mechanics they teach you is that it's like the world is repeating so if you fall off a ledge oh, yeah. you you fall past you'll just keep falling and you'll see the ledge going by over and over right so that's the get the world is kind of looping and you, you have to actually use that to traverse the environment and 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 then also you can turn the world so that that a different surface is the floor right so you're trying to like you see something like over there and you're like how do i get there i gotta make this surface the floor and then fall off this way and yeah it's definitely my book it's a pretty yeah. unique game i suck at it i really like i got <laughs> to the part where you start falling and i'm like oh i get this and i couldn't figure out what to do sean made it <laughs> than that though yeah but i did have that same experience you did like there's sort of an initial part where you're in some rooms and you just start getting that mechanic of like switching floors to the walls and stuff and changing the gravity or whatever it is and then as soon as you get outside you just see this giant world and i guess like once you start to realize that it's it's just repeating then you you can kind of maneuver through it but the first moment you're like I don't know where to go. There's just, it's just huge. Yeah. And then I fell off and I was like, I'm done. Like, wh- I don't know where to, where to go. <laughs> I trophy for falling off. So I was happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I, I am kind of getting into it. And I, I just wish that yeah. initial like teaching of the repeating world was on a little bit smaller scale. Like, yeah, I don't I think, think it, right. I don't think it trained my brain. Like I felt like the, the leap was literally and figuratively too big. Like I, I could not, I'm like, you didn't teach me how to play this properly. I don't think. And I, I'm not saying I'm done with it by any means, but I, I felt intimidated, which doesn't happen very often in games. I think we all had the exact same feeling at that part. <laughs> it, it comes back a little bit. It's a, it, uh, it, yeah. And then it gets weird again at the end. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <Cool>. <laughs> um, I guess the only one, uh, I, there's a bunch of other stuff too, but the, the last one I'll mention is uh, Jedi Fallen Order, which I played because you guys were talking about it. And uh, I really love that game. And I'm really happy that uh, you guys mentioned it on the show because uh, I'm not sure I would have played it otherwise. It was a really good Metroidvania. Yeah. yeah. But the I love everything in that game except for, is it Dothromir, the one planet? Oh, uh, the, the map, the level design is so bad. And like the getting back to areas is like, yeah. I love the map in that game. And then that area is just like, what is going on here? Yeah. <laughs> the connections were not very clear. Yeah. Other than that, that game is amazing. And I was hoping that it was going to be, they announced PS5 support and Series X support recently. And, but it's not a new uh, SKU for, I would, oh, I would play through it again. Yeah. yeah. I, I would have gotten the trophies or achievements. <laughs> but they they are doing, making a sequel though, right? Which oh, did they announce that? I'm pretty sure. 
Oh. Or maybe it's just speculation, but I've read some stuff. And I mean, that to me is like, yeah, there was some frustrating stuff in that game. So the sequel could be the chance to just mm -hmm. perfect that. Mm. Great. Yeah, I, watched it, I watched an awesome games done quick, I think, of that game. And it's amazing how those people could find these bugs that break the game and teleport <laughs> you all over the place. And uh, like, it's incredible to watch those things sometimes. And you're like, oh, well, I was a chump for going the, the normal way that you're supposed to go. I could have you know, skipped through this wall and been there already, especially on that, that world where you just want to get back as soon as possible. Yep. Is that it I for you, Graham? Yeah, that's it for me. Okay. I can go next. I played, I played one thing. Uh, when we were talking last week about the PlayStation Play at Home thing, I didn't realize that was for anyone. I thought that was just for ps plus people yeah i did too that's why i didn't mention it on the show i'm like is it i thought it was part of that uh playstation plus library or whatever yeah. not free games for everyone yeah yeah so i uh grabbed the new ratchet and clank game off of there and put a couple hours into that and you know i don't think i've ever played a ratchet and clank game maybe i played it originally when it first came out but i was really really impressed i did not expect it to be this good um, I thought the humor was like over the top at first, but then once I got used to it, it felt natural. Uh, the weapons felt really good. The, I did get kind of stuck sometimes. There was a couple areas where I just kept dying and dying and dying, but the um, distance between where I would start back again and the, the combat I was having troubles with was very close. So it wasn't this long slog to get back or anything. And there's a lot of hidden stuff. Uh, you know, the map, very easy to read. You can tell when there's secrets. You can tell kind of where they are even, at least in the first little area I did. Uh, I like the kind of hub uh, world aspect of it, or I guess like the ability to go to different places. Um, yeah, I was just really, really impressed. Graphic, graphically, it blew me away. I was not expecting it to be, to look as good as it did. And yeah, I don't know. I can't, I'm kind of blown away by it. I'm going to, definitely go back and try to beat it because it was a really good surprise. I did not expect it. And, you know, I was not looking forward to the new Ratchet and Clank at all, uh, but now I am, I am kind of looking forward to it. So, it's, so their strategy worked. It did. It Giving it away worked. for free. You are now in on the new yeah, game. You I would never have a list of the library at first. <laughs> you know it. I'm already there. <laughs> hold, hold suspended. Cause I don't have a PS five. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> That's all I played. That's it. Sean, do you want to talk Undertale or? Yeah. Okay. So I finally beat Undertale. It, I started a while back, not when it first came out, but when it came on PlayStation and then I put it down, started it on Xbox to get back to where I was on PlayStation. So I could go back and platinum it on PlayStation. Got to that part, realized on PlayStation, I fucked up the only boss battle I needed to do pacifist and then started it over on PlayStation <laughs> <laughs> and then platinum did on PlayStation. And uh, I kind of get why people love it. I think it's very interesting and um, funny. The music is great, kind of what I said last week. I don't know if it's as amazing as I, it was made out to be in my mind based on how people were talking about it. But it was a really fun, unique game and a good length too. It's I had read it was six hours. I think it only took me like three-ish or something like that. I guess it depends how much you talk to people and explore, but uh, a nice meta game. And I'm glad I finally uh, got that off the list of shame. <laughs> yeah, I crossed it off my list of shame as well. Um, you know, it it's definitely like, like the sense of humor, like the, you know, kind of earthbound-esque sort of story and, and tone. I, I didn't know the the combat mechanic, that sort of bullet hell kind of thing that they have, which I thought was pretty neat. And, you know, they really switch it up. Like, it's a kind of game where it's like, you know, from moment to moment, things change. Like, it doesn't feel like you're... It doesn't feel repetitive. It doesn't feel like you're doing the same thing over and over again. And so I'm always a fan of RPGs where you... There's a little bit of timing-based stuff or you know, just anything you can do to, to switch it up because, you know, the grind usually gets to me. Um, but, you know, as you said, it's a pretty short game too. So um, now one thing I did want to bring up though, the final boss fight, which I don't want to spoil anything or get too into it, but it was a weird experience where I felt like the first time I did it, first or second time, 
it felt like this is impossible. I'm never going to be able to beat this thing. And then I started progressing through it and not really feeling like I improved or knew what I was doing. Like I was almost like, did, did they like behind the scenes start like, you know, like I, I'm not getting final, hit. Final one? Yeah. Like, because I thought you couldn't actually fail that. Like I, I would, my health is being drained every time and I. Well, that's what I'm talking about. There are certain points where you can die because I did die. Oh, dude, but I, then there's long stretches where I just felt like, I'm, I feel <laughs> like I should be getting hit and dying here and I'm not. So it was a weird I don't know, like maybe you're right. Maybe that's just an obvious thing that like you can't die in these sections, but uh, certainly they don't communicate that to you. So um, I don't know. Maybe I'm just the only one who is. Well, I had an issue with any of the other. My health was getting just like demolished. And I'm like, oh, this is, I might stop playing this game because I don't know what I'm doing wrong. It was kind of like uh, indivisible when I hit that final boss. But the. Then I was like, oh, I guess I just, unless there is like a break point where it's kind of really, unless you totally F it up, they're not making you fail, which could have been the case. Uh, but I, I don't know. I, I love the final boss, like the visual style of it, which is kind of a mess intentionally. I, yeah, yeah. I was really digging it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. I mean, to me, like it's feels like the kind of game too, that would be inspiring you know, in terms of indie games that people might play and be like, you know, I could make a game like this and make you want to get into game development. I feel like it could be that kind of game. Um, but the yeah. other things that make Undertale are the one-off moments. Like when Sans are, is telling jokes and it does like a zoom in and a, a rim shot or something like that. And like, I just went like, if you could do more of that stuff and have more time and money, it would be a much better version of that. And uh, I, I just love those moments in the game. So, although I will say the story, I had heard like the story is amazing and like this meta story. I didn't necessarily, I felt like the moments were kind of meta and I liked the variety in the moments towards the end of the game, but I didn't necessarily take anything away from the story. I know it's kind of built on this. I did a neutral playthrough, so maybe that's, why but like there's the pacifist and uh what's the other one genocide yes yeah, think so. um for like different ways of playing the game so I, I don't know maybe that's where you start to see the story elements more but i didn't take away like wow that story was amazing after playing it i just thought it was funny yeah i mean fun characters memorable characters which you know goes a long way yeah but and the thing that hawk mentioned last week where you said that it worked really well on PC and you're curious about it on console. It did kind of work. Like, I mean, I guess I knew sort of it was coming, but um, it was still convincing, I thought. Yeah, I, I thought it was great. I played on console too. All right, excellent. Any other games to add, Sean? I have nothing else. No, I think that's it. Okay, excellent. Well, Graham, thank you for joining us. It's been too long, buddy. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Game looks awesome. Nobody saves the world coming to Game Pass soonish, I believe it said on the, the trailer. So I'm, well, we're all excited. So uh, thanks again. Check us out or check out the website, nobodysavestheworld.com. Uh, check out youtube.com forward slash game junk. Uh, Huck's, Huck on Twitter is my angry commute or equilibrium sis. And Sean is film junk. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you.